Coleman, welcome. Thank you, Superintendent Gonzalez. It's my pleasure to have a chance to talk to you. Hope to say some things that'll be meaningful and helpful to every single one of you. I always remembered three rules for a speaker. Never ever go over the time allotted, and we won't today. Number two, don't talk about things not on the PowerPoint. Number three, do not depress the audience. I'm gonna do my best today to say some things that'll be helpful, but I'll also have an attempt at a little bit of humor. And by the way, I love elementary school teachers. I mean, I really do. I worked at Millsap Elementary School for 24 state years. And I actually married three Millsap Elementary teachers. <laughs> so I really do love them. So we're going to be talking today about a number of things that have to do with suicide prevention, resiliency, mental health. We had a pretty large crowd here. So I'm probably not the only person that lost a loved one to suicide. When I was 25, my dad died by suicide. I just didn't know enough. I, I just did not know enough in terms of what to look for, what to do. I'd give anything to have that last conversation back. I should have just asked him. He had told me he planned to kill himself. And then I would have had an opportunity to do something to hopefully save his life. By the way, that was 48 years ago last week. If you lost a loved one, you lost a student to suicide, I think I have a pretty good idea of what you've gone through. But I believe strongly in prevention. We can prevent the majority of suicides in this country. And Superintendent Gonzalez actually nailed it. We have to talk about it. Let me quote our Surgeon General. 46,000 suicides a year in this country. We gotta talk about it more in our homes, our schools, the workplace, and our places of worship. So, my brother, my rich older brother, has three homes. One of those is on the east coast of Florida. And he came down last winter, he's a snowbird, and he gave me a call and I could tell he was really upset. I said, Steve, what is it? He said, my neighbor Bob and the condo building was seen holding a gun to his head yesterday. Well, Steve, did anybody rush Bob to the emergency room? No, they didn't. Well, does Bob still have his gun available? Well, I asked his wife about that. She said, I couldn't possibly take away my husband's guns. Then my brother said, what difference would that make? He'd just find another way, right? No, as a matter of fact, the research is really clear. You remove the lethal means, there's every likelihood they're going to be alive for a very long time. And then my brother said that Bob, his neighbor, was suffering from Parkinson's. So I said, well, Steve, I have a theory. I bet he's being treated for his Parkinson's, but not for all the accompanying depression. I'm really proud of my brother. He actually went with Bob to see the doctor. Bob shared his suicidal behavior, and Bob's being treated not just for Parkinson's, but for depression. About 70% of the time, a person of any age who died by suicide actually saw their family physician shortly before their death. I know my father did. So there is an opportunity if our physicians were tuned in, trained, felt comfortable, competent. So last week, I'm pleased to tell you that my university actually has two medical schools. Last week, I had all 430 first-year medical students for an hour talking about their important role in suicide prevention. We've all been through a lot with the pandemic. And by the way, I could spend quite a bit of time right now sharing with you all the things that we could be worried about in this world. The pandemic is not over. We've lost more than one million Americans. You knew some of them. Some of your students undoubtedly lost a caregiver. We have more and more families and poverty than ever before. We have political polarization beyond anything I've ever seen in my lifetime. We have racial tension. We have a war in Eastern Europe. All of these things are affecting our young people. 
And by the way, when they're at their worst, that is actually when they need us the most as we all try to provide them the assistance and the help that they need. So the superintendent already talked a lot about education is more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. Years ago, I wrote an article for the school board journal, the fourth R. The fourth R is relationships. If I had my way, every classroom in America would spend time helping kids identify their go-to trusted adult. What do I think about now having responded to 17 school shootings? They really all should have been prevented. What do I think about the countless suicides? And by the way, too much of my work has always been one or two or more days too late. We should have been able to prevent the majority of those tragedies. If every kid just knew what a good friend do, if somebody's threatening homicide or suicide, they brought a gun to school, what a good friend do, they go to a trustworthy role. And I actually grew up in a small town in Kansas. 82 kids in my class. You know what that meant for me? Man, I was needed. Scott, you want to play football? You bet. Hey, you want to march in the band during the halftime of the game? Do that too. You want to part in the play? It's yours. But in large schools, we're really challenged to make sure that every kid actually feels connected to school activities and has that go-to trusted adult. I love Gandhi's quote, our ability to reach unity and diversity will be both the beauty and the test of our civilization. We need to embrace the incredible diversity we are so fortunate to have in this country. Moving on, Surgeon General came out with a report just at the end of 2021. That report made recommendations for schools, communities, caregivers, and students themselves, and essentially said, we must seize the moment to protect the mental health of our youth. I'd encourage you to look at that report. And I'm going to highlight just a few of the things that were in it, but I'll never forget one statement. Social media is wrecking havoc with our youth, making them think they're not smart enough, rich enough, nor are they good enough. By the way, how many of you are parents? Would you mind raising your hands? How many of you are parents of adolescents? I am so sorry. <laughs> but of course, I don't mean that. But in today's world, it's not enough to know your kid's friends. You gotta know your kid's friend's parents. You have to be the one that absolutely knows what's going on. And you've already glanced at that about how do we make mental health and wellness as important as medical health? How do we work in all of these various settings? Do you know that we have a national recommendation now? Every eight-year-old and older child seeing a physician for any reason should be screened for anxiety beginning at age eight. We had a recommendation that came out 23 years ago that said every teenager seeing a physician for any reason should be screened for depression and suicide before they walk out of that office. We have a lot of work to do. And by the way, maybe at the foundation for all of us in getting through difficult times, Besides being surrounded by family and friends, it's getting the proper amount of rest. During the height of the pandemic, somehow I doubt that I'm the only person that would wake up at like 4 a.m. in the morning worrying about this world we all live in, and I can't get back to sleep. Sleep deprivation for kids and for all of us is definitely connected to having lots of difficulty and even becoming depressed and suicidal. We do live in a fast-paced world. I like the concept of bringing back the family meal. McDonald's has a slogan, right? They have the full value meal. Where is it really? It's around your kitchen table with free and easy communication. Somehow I doubt that I'm the only person in this room that experienced a divorce 
For me, that was six times. Just kidding. Okay. But you know what really helps? My ex-wife is a psychologist. We made a pact. You don't talk badly about me to our children. I won't talk badly about you. You ever had a seven-year-old kid say, I bet if I'd have been better last year in first grade, I, then my daddy wouldn't have left us. Kids often feel in the middle every day, every way. And yes, I did receive the Helping Parkland Heal Award. But you know what my message has been to Stoneman Douglas parents time after time? When a kid lives in a stable home, when they're shown unconditional love every day, every way by their parents, that kid can overcome almost anything. But you're immediately thinking of kids in your classes, they're not in a stable home. And maybe they're not shown that unconditional love. But that's exactly what kids thrive on, which is stability and being shown love. And by the way, I like to say that every kid does far more right than wrong. You ever heard what's called the five to one rule? Point out five things somebody did right before you zap them for something that was not a great decision on their part. And then I'm going to ask you something. Can you think for a moment about that person in your life who gives you the benefit of their negativity like every time you see them? The one who's always awfulizing and worrying and never saying anything positive to you? Here is your tip for this afternoon. Stay away from that person. Seek out the people in your life that are positive and encouraging and be that person for your students and for your friends and for your family. So, let's just zero in on the last point there. Caregivers must address their own mental health needs, their substance abuse issues, and reduce kids' access to things. I like to call it the four cabinets. We have four cabinets in our home. The gun cabinet, we need to lock it up from children. We have the medicine cabinet, we need to lock it up. We were in a motorcycle accident a few years ago. A few broken bones, we survived with surgeries. We were provided so many painkillers. They've got to be locked up. So kids don't raid a medicine cabinet and take it all to a party. Then we had to lock up the liquor cabinet. The law says 21, right? So we raised our kids right here in Texas. So what did I say to them? In my humble opinion, all of your grandparents were alcoholics. <laughs> Alcoholism seems to be running in the Poland family. I hope you won't drink at all. But I'm certainly never going to look the other way. I'm never going to provide it. And I'm never going to condone it until you are of age. Unfortunately, kids all over America get access to alcohol at very early ages. So what's the fourth cabinet? That would be the internet. That would be paying attention and keeping in mind developmental considerations about the internet and social media. I'd be remiss today not to talk about the challenge of being LGBTQ+. By the way, there's nothing inherently suicidal about being gay. It's about crap and rejection they get, sometimes from the people closest to them. My good friend Michael, he's actually an elementary teacher, he's a great guy. Here's what he said to me. Scott, when I came out 18 years ago, my dad said, Michael, you're dead to me. Michael's dad has not spoken to him in 18 years. How do we stop that from happening in our families? And by the way, what is the single greatest protective factor for a gay kid in America? It's parental acceptance. That's what protects them. So, recommendations for lots of young people. And by the way, I want to zero in on my favorite app there. It was actually developed by an adolescent in Australia. Rethink Works. So how does it 
How do we operate? If a kid has that app on their technology device, it recognizes harmful, hurtful things, and it sends the kid a message. Is this really what you want to say? Maybe you would like to reword or rethink this. They have data saying about 90% of the time, the kids change the message to have it be kinder, or they simply don't send that message at all. And sometimes in schools, I hear something like this from the assistant principal. Well, it was one thing posted online. It was nasty, it was humiliating, but it was only one thing. By definition, it has to be repetitive, right? Well, wait a minute. One kid posted it, and 48 kids said they agreed with it. And this does impact learning. And by the way, the cyberbullying, the statements, they are much nastier than most kids would ever say in person. So the anonymity of that really leads itself to some really hurtful messages. Okay, moving on. Pretty well covered this point, except maybe you need to notice that the cyberbullying, the social media, it seems to be impacting our female students more than it's impacting the male students. It's wrecking havoc with their lives. It's consuming their lives. In an auditorium like this, one time I said, don't let technology steal your children. And a guy jumped up and said, they've already been stolen. And unfortunately, that's pretty true for the adolescents. Some of you have small children. You work in elementary school. Maybe we have the ability to just raise a few questions developmentally about what might be appropriate with regards to the internet, screen time, and social media for an eight-year-old third grader. Raise your hand if you were raised in a home that had only one phone and had a cord on it. Do you remember that? And obviously it was many years ago, but when I walked in from high school and walked into my house, it was a safe haven. I mean, nobody could reach me, right? They could call on the phone. My mom would hand it to me. It had a cord on it. She wasn't moving. Am I gonna have a long, anguishing conversation with anybody? So think how much this has changed in our world today because kids are reached all the time with this constant barrage of things posted in social media. And I had this conversation with some parents near Atlanta and I said something pretty straightforward. Tell your adolescent, it's 10.30, it's time for you to be in bed. Hand me all your devices. They will be charged and ready for you in the morning. A mom comes up to me and she says, what if my eighth grade daughter's friend needed to reach her in the middle of the night? They wouldn't be able to. Well, if something is so serious, maybe your daughter's friend should contact her parents, don't you think? And I guess if you have your daughter's phone and you want to answer it at 3 a.m., you could. But you know, I didn't convince her. She walked away believing that her daughter needed to be available 24-7 to her friends. So all those devices, it's like they're under the pillow. There's literature that estimates one-third of all teenage girls in this country wake up in the middle of the night to check to see who might have posted something about them. How did we get in that particular position? So, moving on. Parent conferences. I understand they're ongoing here, but in various places around the country, there are certain days for this. So you can tell me if I'm totally off base with this idea, but in that parent conference, of course, you're going to talk academics. You're going to talk about behavior. I always try to begin with something really positive. Then maybe I've got to discuss something in the middle of a conference, not so positive. And then I would always end with something positive. Would it be inappropriate? After we've covered academics and behavior, I have the parents of a third grader here. If I say, can we talk a little bit about screen time? How much time does your eight-year-old spend on screens? Do you pay attention to the social media? Are they involved in that at all? 
So maybe the parent says, none of your business. But maybe they say, well, you've been teaching third graders for 22 years. Um, what thoughts do you have about what's appropriate? And then I want to share with you something I only heard about when I was in Chicago recently. Wait until 8. I actually misheard it, and I thought, because they're talking about smartphones, right? So, all right, wait until age 8. Well, that's a start, but is that good enough? Oh, you misunderstood. It's wait until 8th grade. So every kid needs to be able to contact parents or grandparents or reach somebody, right? So you get a watch, the kind of watch that allows you to make six calls. They're all programmed. Okay? So then, obviously, every kid is going to say, all of my friends have a smartphone. But maybe the beauty of wait until eighth grade is the organization connects you with other parents in your community that are waiting. So you can say, as a matter of fact, here are all the parents whose kids go to your school that have made this choice. So I don't have every answer here, but Surgeon General basically saying social media is wrecking havoc with our youth. We're going to have to take a step back in some of these issues. And then kids always are going to look to the adults in their life to see how upset to be about something. And self-care during the pandemic became more important than ever before. Some people got the idea that self-care is selfish. It is not. Self-care is taking care of you. So you'll be the best teacher, the best parent, the best friend, the best partner. So we're going to talk about it. And the stress always comes from work, family, friends. We get worn out. We don't sleep well. We need to engage in self-care activities. So what are those? Well, at the simplest level, healthy diet, exercise, and the proper amount of rest. And then we have to find the creative outlets for us. Maybe that's art, music, gardening, maybe it's taking care or spending time with pets. And during the pandemic, my partner got really depressed. By the way, we have 20 grandchildren. Can anybody beat that? <laughs> you know, our son Jeremy has eight children. Would somebody please tell him to stop? <laughs> so, our four children were pretty controlling, worried about our health, worried about everything. We actually went like eight months without seeing a single grandchild. My wife was very depressed because she retired and spending time with grandchildren was truly what made her happy. So I was able to keep her busy for a while, for about two months because we renovated a house. She had a place to go every morning. She was helping the contractor, running to and from Home Depot, getting the right things, then the house is done. And I can tell she's really depressed. Still can't see grandchildren. So I did what a lot of people did. I bought her a puppy. Do you have any idea what a little designer fluffy puppy cost in Miami during the height of the pandemic? I mean, sir, I bought cars for much less money than I paid for taxes. Kathy has done wonders. And I'll tie pets to, you're actually looking at the highest risk group for suicide in America. That would be an old white man. If we have health, family, and financial problems, we can very much be at risk for suicide. You know what might make all the difference in the world? Having a pet, having a reason to get up every single morning, because our pet needs to go outside. So hopefully you're already thinking about those creative avenues that you use. And by the way, Donna also got really into paint by numbers. She ordered those. She spent hours producing really some beautiful paintings. She got one of those for me. I took one look at the fine motor requirements to put the paint in those squares. That is not going to relax me. But you have to find what are the things that you can do 
that provide health care to you. And I'm pretty sure that many of you are regularly involved in a church, maybe a temple, maybe a mosque. And connections to places of worship are really very important to us. But not everybody goes to a place of worship every week. There's another part of this that I like to call the spiritual side. And a spiritual side is really just always trying to be helpful to others, being friendly, being respectful, embracing all of the diversity in our country, just being kind. Can you imagine how much better our world would be if everybody exemplified those values? Just trying to be kind, helpful, friendly, be a good neighbor, be a good citizen. We need to work on that. And getting outside into nature is very, very important. Unfortunately, during the height of the pandemic, they even closed the beaches where I lived, which was a bit of a mistake because that's one of the ways we can get a little bit of opti optimistic view of the world is just get out in the sunshine. Ride a bicycle. Is anybody going to get too close to you if you're actually moving down the street on a bicycle? So embracing nature and getting outside is incredibly important. And then you see all those I can statements. I can get enough sleep by doing these things. I can get exercise. I can be helpful. I can be positive. But you're all elementary age. So what in terms of the kids that you teach? So I've just gone over what I believe every adolescent, every adult should be doing. And I do remember one project where high school kids are telling me, I sit in front of my computer screen all day long for my virtual learning, and then I'm given homework. Why can't they give me homework that has to do with self-care? Pretty wise comment from a high school kid about what we all needed during those difficult times. But what about an elementary age kid? They draw a picture of themselves they put it in the center of the poster board. Or maybe you print off a picture. And they draw themselves engaging in activities that make them happy. Engaging in activities where they're helpful to other people. Getting some exercise. Eating healthy food. I'm hopeful that as a result of a horrific pandemic, that maybe all Americans, and especially our schools, learn the importance of self-care and focusing on mental health and wellness. And now that I've used the term mental health, most of the time when I bring it up, you know what somebody talks to me about? Mental illness. What is mental health? It's basically being able to balance things in your life, being productive, feeling connected to the workplace, your family, having some problem-solving skills and being able to manage stressful times. And I may be the oldest person in this room, but you know what I've decided life is all about? Life is about meaning and finding meaning and helping other people. That's why you all were attracted to elementary education, which was to make a difference in kids' lives. And I know without exception, you are all doing that. My partner said, are you going to work at the university until you die? I said, I mean, I just might. I get a lot of meaning from what I do every single day. I'm in absolutely no hurry to retire. So I hope that you get a lot of meaning out of your work. So I could go on for the rest of the afternoon into tomorrow about issues that have to do with school safety. My first testimony about School violence prevention before Congress was like a month before Columbine. And I'll stand by two things that I said then. 23 years later, we got to take guns out of the hands of children. If a kid does not have access to a gun, they're not going to be able to shoot anybody at school. It's that simple. And if they do, we're going to have to prosecute their parents. And maybe that will help parents understand you have the right to gun ownership. But with that right 
becomes a responsibility to safeguard the gun from an angry, depressed, substance abusing, mentally ill person that might reside in your very own home. We've never held parents accountable. We might. We have the parents in Oxford, Michigan, who've now been in jail for a year. So I don't know what the outcome will be, will be from that case. The second thing that I stand by that I said 23 years ago, we've got to increase mental health self services for children in our schools all across America. And I was just reading my phone, and the federal government has just released many million dollars available for grants to increase mental health services in our school. But the challenge is we don't have enough school counselors, school social workers, or school psychologists. I spoke in Tampa, Florida recently, and they told me they have 80 openings for school psychologists that they cannot fill. To change this, we're going to have to provide like free tuition, some kind of stipend. Something that makes somebody decide, okay, I'm willing to go to graduate school for two or three years. So, pretty well covered most of those points. What is the motivation of a school shooting? One of two things, sometimes it's both. Glory, and unfortunately our media gives them glory. Second motivation, getting even. Some kind of justice for what they believe they were somehow mistreated and wronged. And again, more emphasis on mental health services, and maybe we get to the bottom of this, more emphasis on threat assessment teams, and maybe we'll be able to prevent some of these strategies. So moving on, here's something I wish I could say to every parent in America. Your kid can't even joke about a school shooting. They say it, they post it, doesn't really matter whether they had a grudge, motivation, a plan, access to a weapon. You're eight years old in Florida and you threaten to shoot somebody at school, you're going to be prosecuted with a second degree felony. And unfortunately, TikTok and the challenges that were presented to kids last year, things like go to a school and destroy something and then post it. This would all go back to all that technology, we've got to view it as a privilege. It's not a right. And parents do need to pay attention. So, been at this a long time. So, Donna's retired school principal. We've done three state suicide prevention plans for Texas. We did the one for Montana. We did the one for Florida. We produced a draft for New Jersey. So my highest professional priority has been preventing the suicide of a young person. And it's almost always the result of untreated or undertreated mental illness, often in combination with adverse childhood experiences. So what are those? Those are all the things we don't want to have happen to a kid. Rejection from a natural parent, living in poverty, being physically, emotionally, sexually abused, death of the parent, or being the victim of bullying. Here's something I hope you'll take out of this afternoon. You know a kid's a victim of bullying? Don't hesitate to ask them questions about hopelessness and giving up. So what does the research say? Strong association between bullying and suicide. Hard to say that it was absolutely causal, because how do you rule out all the other adverse experiences in addition to untreated or undertreated mental illness? So, suicide is the second leading cause of death, middle school age through high school. Adolescents, unfortunately, are the most susceptible to suicide imitation. Did you have to have known the suicide victim? Not at all. You just know what they did. And it's something you've been thinking about. Now you're one step closer to making a suicide attempt. 
And what I hear all over the country, more and more elementary age kids are talking about suicide. And then I always get this question, do I have to take it seriously? He's only nine years old. Yes, you do take it seriously. You involve your school mental health professionals. There needs to be an initial screening. Parents need to be notified. I know it's frustrating. I wish little Roberto could just say, I'm angry about X. He shouldn't have to say, I'm going to kill myself to get our attention. But if they're talking suicide, we must take it seriously. When there is a suicide, no one person, no one thing is ever to blame. The answer is die with them. We need to focus on the living. And how do we prevent further suicide? Okay. If I was sitting there today, I'd want somebody to talk about what works according to the World Health Organization. We just discussed reducing adverse childhood experiences. We talked about removing lethal means. And the next one, actually mentioned it already too getting physicians more involved in suicide prevention. The majority of the time, the person who died by suicide at any age actually went to see their family physician shortly before their death. So physicians have a tremendous opportunity. So those are some questions for you. And guys, where does Texas stand with regard to the problem of suicide? We're in the middle range. Where are the highest suicide rates? Somebody just shout out a state. Shout out states where you think they have the highest suicide rate. Ohio. Over here, I heard New York City. I need to say something. I was in New York City recently. Those people are not suicidal. They are homicidal. My attempt at a little humor. But to simplify it, all the western states, with the exception of California, have high suicide rates. All the eastern states have low suicide rates. Texas would be somewhere in the mid-range. Now, a chance for you to talk to your neighbor for just a second. See the last point up there? Who is the most protected against suicide? By race and gender. Turn to your neighbor for just a second. I'm really asking who has the lowest suicide rate by race and gender. See if you can come up with the right answer. Thank you, and I think I heard the right answer. The correct answer is black females. Why? Why is their suicide rate so much lower? Family, faith, purpose. So it's important that we all think about those are key components to suicide prevention. So what protects youth against suicide? You can glance at that. I've already talked about the importance of family stability and kids being shown unconditional love. You're going to see school connections up there, access to mental health treatment, lack of access to lethal weapons, religion involvement, knowing when to seek adult help. These are the keys. And problem solving, I want to give you a personal example. Jeremy was eight years old. Son, I need to talk to you more about the death of your grandfather, he says. I mean, I never met the man. He died before I was born, but you told me he had a heart attack. It is true he had a heart attack. There's more to the story. I want you to hear this from me, never from someone else. Two weeks after his heart attack, your grandfather shot himself. The word is suicide. You lied to me. No, I was just waiting to give you the complete information. Now that you're eight, maybe you can understand what this word suicide means. He thinks a while and then he looks up and says, Oh, Dad, you shouldn't feel guilty. Oh, why is that? Well, your dad wasn't a psychologist like mine. He didn't teach you all the things you taught me about how important it is to feel good about yourself. 
I mean, Dad, every kid has problems. They just have to know to get adult help. And whatever comes along, they need to believe they're going to get through it. Now, wasn't that sweet that he was trying to alleviate my guilt? What's the most important point there? He's eight years old. He believes he's a good person. He's a problem solver. Isn't that what you want for every single kid in your 31 elementary schools? Just to feel like whatever it is, they will get the help they need. I wish I could give you magic dust to sprinkle their heads in class tomorrow. So they were all problem solvers with an optimistic view of the future. These quotes, very quickly, we've never really funded suicide prevention in this country. And then Dr. Inestis is really pointing out guns are only involved in 5% of suicide deaths. But they account for, guns are used in 5% of attempts. Let me get this right. They account for more than 50% of the deaths. You don't get a second chance if you use a gun. So, and you got a fourth grader. The fourth grader has maybe written something about suicide. Maybe you realized they were on their computer and they put the word suicide and were researching how to do this. What should happen? You can't just say, go to the counselor now, because they might not make it to the counselor's office. You basically have to somehow get that kid escorted into the counseling office by another adult. Surgeon General basically saying, we can do something about this if we were not so afraid to talk about it. And great concern about suicide with our military veterans and our active duty military, absolutely. Center for Disease Control kind of simplified all of this, saying it's all about connections. And if somebody dies by suicide, it's like we failed. We didn't have them connected enough to school, the workplace, and to the community. And then, CDC has done what are called epidemiology studies, and I think I said that word correctly, epidemiology. They're the factors that they found when they studied youth suicides. Mental health concerns, family problems, bullying, substance abuse, psychological distress. I was involved in this case, in the interest of time, I'll make it very quick. Louisville ISD. I was on the side of the plaintiff. There were so many warning signs that nine-year-old Montana was being bullied and he was thinking of suicide. He got counseling, but his counseling never addressed his depression nor his suicide. Let me just quote the nurse for you. Somebody had ever told me Montana Lance was suicidal. I'd have certainly never let him go in my bathroom where I knew I couldn't unlock the door. 30 times in four months, he was disciplined by the assistant principal. Does that sound excessive to you? 16 times he saw the nurse in four months. Seven of those times he was physically injured at school. It's literally, where was the circle of care? Where was the school psychologist, the teacher, the assistant principal, the nurse? Parents all huddling up and saying, what in the world is going on with Montana Lakes? I was on the side of the plaintiff. When I was deposed, the attorney for the district said, all right, Dr. Polin, you just tell us all the ways you think we messed up. I just told you all those ways. Yet the Texas Eastern District Court and the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court did not find in favor of the plaintiff. They did comment on the assistant principal, though. They said, you know, she did it wrong. She didn't see a single incident all year long for the fourth and fifth graders as possibly being bullying. Really? Do we have a school that has no bullying? I don't think so. So they said, she didn't discriminate against Montana Lance. She just did it wrong for everybody. Okay. Another fifth grade example. I was on the side in the district in this case. I don't think they did anything wrong. 
Did they know Brandon was being bullied? Yes, they did. They increased supervision. They provided support for Brandon. They told the bullies, these are the consequences today. You keep these up, and the consequences will escalate. You know what maybe the saddest thing in all of this is sometimes kids say something like, you get bullied enough, you start to think you deserve it. No kid deserves to be bullied. So Brandon, in fifth grade, wrote a suicide note. He actually drew a picture of himself hanging. And the note said, if somebody doesn't stop me, I will hang myself at 4.35 today. He handed that note to a fifth grade classmate. You ever anticipate a 10 or 11 year old being in that position? Anybody ever prepare her for that around the kitchen table? Or at Sunday school? Or even in fifth grade? Unfortunately not. She didn't say a word to any adult. Brandon went home, and he hung himself that afternoon. I was on the school side. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't ignore anything. They had no idea that Brandon was suicidal. But the insurance company made them settle out of court for a half a million dollars. So pretty well covered most of those points removing lethal means, fourth R, relationship, family, cohesiveness and stability. I cannot say enough about that. So, if a student is really intent on killing himself, there is nothing anybody can do to stop them. True or false? Very astute group here. The intervention of any one person can make all the difference in the world. So does it take like a school psychologist to intervene? Do we have to have special training? That'll be one of the next questions. But any one person can make all the difference in the world. If we talk about it, we're going to plant the idea in their head. True or false? They're already very aware of it. They have suicidal friends. They're exposed to suicide online, through movies, television programs. I remember decades ago, I was taking our youngest daughter to a movie. It was about Billy Mills, who was an American Indian who won a gold medal in the Olympics. Okay? Sounds like a great story, right? That's until they showed the suicide of his brother back on the reservation. I remember not being so shocked. I was like, all of a sudden, my seven-year-old sees this because I had no idea that was part of the story. So, talking about it, it actually, if somebody is suicidal, it gives them a chance to unburden themselves. Realize I'm, I'm not alone. I'm not the first person to feel this way. There is help available for me. And then, of course, we need to realize at the simplest level, if a kid keep talking about suicide, what are they saying? I need help. I need things to change. I need support. I'm even going to argue if a kid says something about school violence, we need to view it as a red flag. A red flag, we need intervention. We need a multidisciplinary team with people like school psychologists, law enforcement, teachers who know the kid in question well, administrators. Everybody getting to the bottom of what's going on. And we need to reserve our harsh consequences for a substantial threat. So what's a substantial threat? It's repeated over time. There's a grudge, motivation, there's a plan, there's a weapon. That's a lot different from a kid who says something impulsively and stupidly, like I'm going to kill you. Consequences for the transient threat, yes. But we don't want to kick every kid out of school who impulsively says something stupid with no plan, no grudge, no weapon. Okay. All right. Only experts can prevent suicide. All of us can do it. Okay. By knowing what to look for, working as a team, make sure we never keep a secret about suicide. All right. A few facts. You can glance at those. By the way, the suicidal individual 
they're experiencing what they view as unenduring pain. They have tunnel vision constriction. Not that they really want to die. They want to escape that pain. And most of the time, there's no no, which leaves many families wondering forever and wanting to think it's anything but a suicide. And yes, there is a relationship between self-injury, i.e. cutting, and suicide. By the way, why do kids engage in superficial cutting or burning? It regulates emotions. It releases endorphins. The very endorphins we wish they would release by chasing a ball this afternoon or walking around the track or getting on some kind of exercise machine. It works, but it has diminishing returns. It's not working as well months from now as it's working right now. And a typical adult response, if the kid is cutting the wrist, for example, to release endorphins, we're horrified. We want to tell them, stop that. Don't you ever do that again. But it fulfills a multitude of complex needs for them. And we need to work on substitute behaviors, reducing the behavior, getting them the right mental health treatment, which is really dialectical behavior therapy. So, back to suicide for a moment. All right, the age of the kid that just banged his head against the mirror, high school senior, college freshman, ever since the breakup, I haven't been able to study. I'm failing. I should just give up. Life is not worth living anymore. What would you say to them? You know what we usually do? We're dismissive. It's not that bad. You'll get through it. Or we want to give them a little life lesson. Let me talk about something that happened to me when I was about your age. How should we respond? Recognizing the pain, they're overwhelmed. They don't see a way out. And asking directly, are you thinking of suicide? I will be here for you every step of the way. We have trained school personnel to help you. So there's the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey of high school students in America. There's the Texas data. You know what a lot of people have said? We need to do YRBS, Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, on elementary age kids. Some states actually do it for middle schoolers. Hopefully the Texas 2021 data will be out soon. Let's just zero in on the bottom figure. All right, I'm going to estimate you have some schools with 2,500 students in it. What's our best data? Our best estimate? 250 kids that are going to walk into that high school tomorrow made a suicide attempt in the last 12 months. You know what's really scary? For the most part, their parents, their high school counselors, teachers, administrators have no idea who those kids are. But who would know all about their previous suicidal behavior? That would be their friends. But if we ever talk to kids about what to look for, what to do, don't keep a secret. Get adult help. Call 988. Use the crisis text line. Get help. I could spend hours on this. But suicide prevention in schools involves everybody knowing what to look for, what to do, working as a part of the team. Getting the kid in question that we think is at risk to a counselor, social worker, school psychologist. Get an initial screening. Notify parents. Only one exception. You tell me you believe the kid is being abused, and I'm going to say, now we're calling protective services. Parents need to be notified. And we need to have direct discussions with them about seeking mental health treatment in the community, increasing supervision, locking up lethal means. And if the kid has been in a hospital, we've got to have a meeting. We've got to talk about how can the school coordinate with the community or hospital-based treatment. And I get this question a lot. A counselor will say, I know the kid's suicidal, but I can't tell the teachers, right? My response is wrong. Teachers are part of your team. 
We don't need to give them a lot of detailed information, but we should simply say depression and suicide is a major concern. If you see any of these behaviors, get them escorted to my office. Pretty well covered that point. One more case. This is a Cypher case. Kid's name was Asher. Mom enrolled him at the middle school. Mom told the counselor, Asher's been bullied in every school he ever attended. And he has a couple of those psychiatric diagnoses. Mom said the counselor told her, no worries. We don't have any bullies here. Really? Middle school of 1400 and you don't think you have any bullies. Now I want you to look at the physical description of Asher. Because I never met him. I only know about him after he shot himself. Small for his age, frail, pale, walked funny, had a bad skin rash, spoke with the list, and he identified as gay and Buddhist. What do you think life's going to be like for him in a large middle school? What class would be the most challenging? P.E. I want to be fair to P.E. teachers. We put way too many kids in a class at one time. You know what the mom said? The PE teacher said, didn't even know who that kid was until after he shot himself. I said two things, and they were not popular. He should have stood out the moment he walked into middle school. He was going to be bullied. We know that bullying peaks in middle school. And very unfortunate that, unlike here, the only people in the entire middle school trained on the warning signs of suicide were three school counselors. All right, moving on. Rare at the elementary level. Dramatic increases, though, for middle school age girls. Second leading cause of death, actually middle school through college age. And we've already talked briefly about the elderly population. I can't say enough about this, and I always try to do it tactfully. It's not a question of ownership. It is a question of responsibility. So let me quote a Houston teenager's goodbye note for you. Here's what she said to her parents. Why did you make this so easy? Why did you leave this gun available to me? There's Dr. Ines' book, The Golden Gate Bridge, the single scene of the most suicides in the United States. They've been debating for 70 years putting a net below the bridge. It's finally under construction. It will be completed sometime in 2023. It will save lives. It is that simple. There are lots of risk factors. It's almost like a perfect storm where lots of things go wrong at the same time. The kid has traveled a long road, yes. But it's usually some kind of precipitating event. They've been thinking about suicide for a while, and then we have a precipitating event. The most common precipitating event is a severe argument with parents, the breakup of a romance, an extreme humiliation, or maybe a discipline problem. I'm sorry to tell you there's lots of examples where when the kid hears you're suspended. You're probably going to be expelled. They've been thinking about suicide for a while. They leave that conference and go home and die by suicide. Last thing before the break. Let me quote the hearing officer in Fairfax County, Virginia. Tenth largest school district in the nation. Says me. Got him haunted by something. I upheld the kid's expulsion that very night. He shot himself at home. Now when I'm holding an expulsion hearing, I have a counselor standing by so we can immediately offer assistance to the kid that we just expelled from our schools. So let's take 10 minutes. I know that's actually 15. So that means we're going to begin no later than 2.15. And if anybody has any questions or comments for me, please come up. So see you in 15 minutes. So my very next slide, 
Somebody use Brandy. I just met Brandy. I want you to imagine Brandy, a school psychologist here. Let's imagine Brandy is a 14-year-old girl. She's devastated by the breakup of the first significant relationship in her life. I'm the well-meaning adult, right? Brandy, I'm so sorry about what's happened to you. I'm sure today things are really difficult. Brandy, you know, time pretty much has a way of healing everything. If you'll just be patient, things are going to get better every single day. Brandy, if you don't mind, I'd like to share with you what happened to me when I was 14. Yes, I got through that. I just turned 73 and I'm really happy. Brandy, you are going to be okay. And maybe I pat her on the shoulder. Did I help her at all? Was I dismissive? Did I give her a pep talk? Some little life lesson? I think you all know what I should have been saying. I can't imagine. This must be so hard. You must be so worried. Are you thinking there won't be another significant relationship? I should have used all those open-ended questions. And if you don't mind me telling you, when I was 14, Doris Nelson broke up with me, and I know she is still sorry. <laughs> Sir, she started dating a senior, and she married that SOB. <laughs> it's like I never saw her again. I can't even find her on Facebook. I think she's somewhere in Louisiana, but I still can't find her. But I am over it. All right. My attempt at a little humor today. You are the gatekeepers. You see, hear, know things about kids. And you really must be alert. But you spend quite a bit of time on what are the morning signs? not taking pride in appearance, dramatic changes in behavior, researching how to kill yourself, writing about it, poems about it, giving away prized possessions, making out a will, and with kids just simply being overwhelmed by everything going on in their life. So it's so important to work with the other staff and just be alert to concerns. And I think I pretty well mentioned most everything on that slide. Some things are very direct, some things are really indirect. You know, I should have realized something when my dad said, I never want to live to be an old man. Nobody will ever have to take care of me. He even started talking about what he wanted me to have when he was going to leave me. So how in the world did I not grasp that? It's pretty hard when it's somebody in your family, because we're just... We just don't think that could ever happen to one of our family members, friends, or to one of our students. And particularly elementary age kids might threaten to run into traffic. They might be jumping from one high place to another. They might have a broken bone or two that's resulted in them going to like an emergency room. So very important that we are alert. And remember, what's the good news? No kid is suicidal 24-7. They're seeing unendurable pain, but there could be a glimmer of hope. I made the team. I'm not repeating eighth grade. My dad's getting treatment. Something good is happening in our family. So very important to follow your district procedures, work as a part of the team. Maybe even use some of these statements. Thank you for telling me what's really going on. Thanks for trusting me. We have other people at the school that are going to work with us. It's so important to me that you do not hurt yourself, that we figure out what we need to do to get you help. Suicide is preventable. That's hopefully another message you'll take home from today. And then I love this phrase about one caring adult in the life of a child is the greatest protective factor there is. Many of you are that caring adult. And there are evidence-based treatments to help all of us. And we're going to talk about resiliency in a few moments. And I'm going to skip through self-injury. Just know there are a lot of slides. But I want to call your attention to one thing. 
That would be a video that I did for the state of Florida. At that, my website, I interviewed two young women who speak very eloquently about their struggle with self-injury. I asked them all the logical questions you would want to know. How did you get control of this? What did your parents do? What did the school counselor do? What treatment helped? How long did you engage in this behavior? Why did you do it? So just know that's about a two-hour video available at my website. Most school districts do not have a plan to deal with self-injury. And it's important that we have that plan. And again, working as part of a team. All right, screen age. Kids spend many hours on their screens. Some kids are online almost constantly. And they're exposed to lots of things we don't want them exposed to. And I'd be remiss today not to identify what are the typical reactions a kid has to a traumatic event? They regress academically. They regress behaviorally. They have nightmares, sleeping problems, and worries about the future. And I'm not talking about this being unusual. I'm talking about virtually every kid having one or more of those reactions to some kind of a traumatic event. Common sense media, I cannot say enough about them. You want to find out whether something developmentally appropriate, some movie, some video game, they're going to tell you. They have digital citizenship recommendations across grade levels for kids. Very important that we're aware of that excellent resource. By the way, how many of you saw this Netflix program? Because when it came out, it was the most popular one in history. I'm just curious. If you saw it, I'm sure you recognize many dangerous behaviors. First of all, there was an incredibly graphic, horrific suicide scene. And it implied that suicide is about revenge. It's not. Suicide doesn't have anything to do with other people. It has to do with ending your unendurable pain. And it also implied that every kid is a victim of bullying is going to attempt to die by suicide. Thankfully, that's not the case. Or the play, every kid the victim of sexting is going to attempt suicide. Or every kid raped is going to attempt to die by suicide. This was a program that had so many incorrect messages. But you know what bothered me the most through four seasons? And if you were able to wade through four seasons, you know that towards the end, it was all about a planned school shooting. And you know, through four seasons, not a single kid ever went to an adult for help. It was like these high school kids were leading totally, totally secret lives with regards to sex, drugs, and violence, and adults had no clue whatsoever. The most dangerous message was adults don't matter. And everything needs to be adults staying involved in kids' lives and being seen as somebody who can help them. So, I'm going to comment on, I think, the most dangerous behavior we all engage in. That would be getting out your phone when you get in the car. You ever heard this phrase? Don't be intoxicated. I've had high school kids say, what's the big deal? I mean, I look up every five to 10 seconds to see where I'm going. We know that an accident can happen in just a split second. So the phones in the car are actually wonderful for navigation, right? But very dangerous otherwise. And I love the idea of some schools and some families have developed what they're calling blackout dates. Tonight, nobody will be on their technology. We're going to do something old-fashioned like actually talk to each other or maybe play a board game. You know what I hear from moms? I know the value of a technology-free mealtime. It's my husband. He's the problem. He will not turn off his device. 
Kids are watching all the adults in their lives. Emerson said, what we do speak so loudly to our children and students, when we try to talk to them, they cannot hear us. So the modeling from adults is critically important in so many areas, but especially with regards to trying to balance screen time in our lives. I'm a big believer in telling kids the truth and developmentally appropriate language, not going overboard, just using language they will understand. By the way, if a nine-year-old asks you about sex, are you going to tell them everything you've learned about sex? You can answer their question and stop. And then they might come back 30 minutes later with another question. But I think it's so important that students and children always believe the adults are telling them the truth. I think we can deal with anything. I don't care how horrific it might be when we tell kids the truth. And I'm actually saddened by the fact that we've had this movement in recent years in our country to like close schools. I'll give you an example. So the Burke School in Washington, D.C. called me on April 10th. They had a school shooting. A disturbed adult fired 100 rounds at the school as Staff and students were leaving. By a miracle, he didn't kill anybody. He injured a lot of people. So the headmaster is like, so sad that the seniors will never be able to return to the high school before graduation. And I'm like, they have to be able to come back. We want to resume routines. We want everybody to be together. Well, the school is very shot up. Well. Bring them in a back door. Bring them in a side door. And by the way, if you cancel school for a couple of weeks because of a school shooting, do you think any parents are going to stay home for the next 14 work days? They're going to get up and go to work, which means kids are left to their own devices. And we need to always have everybody view the school as a place where you get help. Now I want to give you a really positive example. A tragic shooting happened on July 4th in Highland Park, Illinois. That was the parade shooting, right? Seven were killed, 17 were wounded. So what was the Highland Park School District's response? They opened up the high school on July 5th. The word went out. Community mental health personnel, school counselors, school psychologists will be here. Do you know in the next two weeks, they provided more than 2,800 counseling sessions, all free. Schools should be seen as a source of help. Now, we spent a long time on the phone with a bunch of Zoom calls, and one of them was they said, you know, we always have the band play for the staff first day back to school, but we can't have the band play this year because the band was playing when the parade shooting happened. I'm like, so important to resume routines. Your staff is coming back 41 days after the school shooting. I think you should have the band play. So it was a big auditorium like this. I'm waiting to be introduced because I'm the keynote speaker. And a very talented high school student went on the stage. She was accompanied by a violinist and she sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow Beautiful. I mean, it's a great song, but it's pretty darn sad, right? So I think to myself, clearly there's going to be no band because we're focusing on Somewhere Over the Rainbow. So I get introduced, and I've had the microphone in my hand for maybe eight or ten minutes. The superintendent comes up, and he's literally pulling the microphone out of my hand. And I'm like, is it not working? Did I say something that was so wrong already? You're pulling me off the stage? And finally, I let go of the microphone, and I hear him say, send in the band. Well, they're coming down the aisles. They're going across the stage. It's very raucous. Everybody is up and cheering. And then the band goes out. And so he says to everybody, I apologize to Dr. Poland. He was not supposed to be introduced until after the band played. So he handed me the microphone and I said, Bruce, I've been pulled off the stage many times. 
but never for such a good reason. So resuming routines is incredibly important for kids, staff members. And by the way, tomorrow morning at 6.30, I'll be on a flight from Austin to Fort Lauderdale. What is the flight attendant going to tell those parents that have a small child with them if there was a problem with the oxygen level in the cabin? Whose mouth does the mask go over first? A parent, absolutely. How do we help the kids the most when something tragic has happened? We help the parents. We help you. So everybody responds with structure, patience, tolerance, and love. Pretty well covered most of those things in my example about the network and not just knowing your kids' friends, know their parents as well. I personally believe we need to stop setting kids' room up to be a little kingdom with every technology device known to man because they will spend all their time in the room instead of interacting with the rest of the family. So bullying tends to speak in middle school. We've talked about bullying in terms of the importance of supporting the victim, consequences and increased supervision for the bullies. I want to get to looking at resiliency. But one more example. A dad stopped me last spring and he says, how do I know my daughter, who's a senior in high school, is depressed? I mean, she's a teenager, right? They're all moody, they're all irritable. I think she's preparing me for, she's going away to Florida State next fall. Dad, let me ask you some questions. Is this persistent? Has this gone on for several weeks or more with your daughter? Yes. Is it pervasive? Is it affecting homeschool peers pretty much every aspect of her life? Yes. Did she drop out of something that was previously very pleasurable for her? Yes. She was on the dance team for the first three years of high school. I couldn't believe it. As a senior, she says, I don't care about it anymore. Dad, you very likely have a depressed teenager. Get her help. This is persistent, pervasive, and they dropped out of pleasurable activities. And I'd be remiss today not to say just a couple more things about substance abuse. So I talked about taking charge of the medicine cabinet. I talked about caregivers and parents being able to manage and hopefully eliminate their own substance abuse issues. What does the law say in Texas about alcohol? Got to be 21, right? What did I say to all our kids? The law is 21. I will never provide it. I will never condone it, nor will I ever look the other way. And in my humble opinion, all four of your grandparents were alcoholics. Apparently, alcoholism seems to run in our family. So I hope you will not drink at all. We're going to have to recognize that too many communities look the other way to underage drinking. Okay, but there it is, resilience. Arguably the biggest word in all of counseling and psychology ever since 9-11-01. The keys to resiliency, being surrounded by loving and caring family and friends. Having the opportunity to vent strong emotions. Always being optimistic about the future. And using problem-solving skills. Surround yourself with supportive, encouraging people. Avoid that person that gives you the benefit of their negativity like every time you see them. So, if I was sitting there today, I'd want somebody to talk about what is it kids need for success in this challenging world we all live in. This is straight out of the Carnegie Foundation. Three or more significant adults in every kid's life besides their parents. Frankly, I think three is probably aiming a bit high. Maybe we just try for one significant adult besides a parent that is always there 
She's going to sing in the choir. Somebody's there. She has the soccer game. Somebody is there besides the parent. Just saying, you are important to me, and I am going to be showing up for you. Sense of safety, security, and belonging. And their home, school, and their neighborhood. So Maslow was the guy that had it right. Maslow was the guy with the pyramid theory. Remember this? What did the foundation of everybody's pyramid? Having their physical needs taken care of for food, water, shelter, safety. Then you advance to the highest level with Maslow called self-sexualization. Oh, God. Self-actualization. Thank you. My attempt at a little humor. But the real question has to do with physical needs for kids. Do they have that sense of belonging in their home, school, their family, and their neighborhood? Now let's talk organized activities. So, most recently, I did a lot of work at the private school on our campus, mostly because my wife was the principal. You know what's amazing what you get if you can pay $30,000 or more for your kids' education? What do you get for that? Small classes, a teacher's aid in every class, every extracurricular activity you can imagine. You want to play ice hockey in South Florida? Well, they have access to a rink. You want crew? You want fencing? Whatever it is, that private school has it. But part of my concern was the kids in this high-performing, very affluent, expensive school, they're involved in too many activities. It's like the activities cause them stress. The club team and the school team conflict. They have a part of the school play, but they also have a part of the community play. I remember saying to those parents, why don't you ask your kid to pick one activity a season? Don't you want life to revolve around your family? You really want them out three or four days a week with all these activities when they're never home interacting with you. So Donna says, what the parents? Heard you speak, Scott. He wants to go to lunch and give a little advice about his son. His son's a junior and his son's really struggling. And then Donna says, He's the most, well, he's the richest man you're ever going to meet, Scott. He buys and sells corporations. In fact, his house on the intercoastal in Fort Lauderdale, the house was really quite massive, but it wasn't big enough. He could not park his 125-foot yacht in front of his house. So he had to buy the house next door so he could park his yacht. So we go to lunch. And right away, here's what he says to me. Tell you what I'm going to do, Scott. I'm going to buy the best life coach money can buy to work with my kid. And I think to myself, I could be a life coach. <laughs> Aren't you all life coaches? Yes, you are. Now, if you've been listening to me, I thank you for your rapt attention this afternoon. I think you probably know what I said to him. Be his dad now. Be involved in his life. In like a year and a half, it sounds like he's going out of state to college. Be involved now. Buy a few less companies. Take him to board meetings. Be involved now. As soon as I said that, I knew I was never going out on that guy. <laughs> but there's a totally other end of the spectrum. And I'm going to go back to Millsap Elementary School that I love so much. And you know what my favorite day was? The first day of school. Trying to help kids get into the right classes. And those who were having difficulty separating from mom and dad. But Leroy was a kid identified with a lot of problems through special education. Leroy was nine. He walks into my office for his weekly counseling session and he goes, Dr. Poland, you know what? I just want to play Little League Baseball. Well, Leroy, 
I actually saw the form in the office. Let's get it. Let's sign you up. He said, you don't understand. My mom doesn't have $75. And even if she did, she could never take me to a practice because she works until 7 o'clock every night. That, unfortunately, is a sad reality for lots of kids. And the contrast between the kids that have so many activities that causes them stress and lots of kids that have zero special activities. So when Jeremy was five, he wanted to play soccer. So I signed him up. They were in need of a soccer coach. All of a sudden, the psychologist is the soccer coach. Do I know anything about it? No. You know what my goal was? I want it to be fun. I want this to be something every kid enjoys. But there was a name on my roster, Bobby Bryan. Bobby Bryan's mom returned no phone calls, and Bobby doesn't show up for the first few practices. Finally, I got Claire Bryan on the phone, and she says very quickly, take his name off. Bob, my husband, left us. He moved back to Chicago. I work nights. He can never go to an after-school practice. Claire, where is Bobby after school? He's in a daycare. You know, if you will give me written permission, I will pick him up at the daycare, take him to practice. I will make sure you have returned home, and then I will deliver Bobby. You know, I drove Bobby Bryan to practice. Well, the last year we were still playing. He was 16 and he had his own car then. Every other year. By the way, he was a great kid and a great little soccer player. We actually won the Texas Recreational Championship when they were 14. So, Bobby Bryan's in the Army now. We're like friends on Facebook. He's got like three kids. It is just so important to step forward, get involved in kids' lives. You recognize anybody up there? <laughs> Boy, do I want all that hair back, okay? <laughs> 1974. I signed up to be a big brother to Rodney. Rodney was 13. Rodney went down to the big brother's office and said, Give me a white big brother. <laughs> Why are you asking for a white big brother? Well, you know, I live in the projects, the poorest part of town, the black men I know are into this or into that. Maybe a white big brother would have more time for me. I made a lot of time for Rodney. I still have a lot of time for Rodney. Here we are, 48 years later. Rodney never knew his dad. Mom's on welfare. She is in a wheelchair. You know, when he was younger, to be honest, it was a lot easier. We'd get together a couple times a week. We'd shoot baskets. We'd go to a Ball State sporting event. We would make a cake. We picked up a bicycle. As he got older, and I'm sure you're all aware that Big Brothers Big Sisters actually officially ends at age 18. You may not be aware that to get a big brother in America, there's typically a multi-year waiting list. I'm talking like four years. You sign up because you want a big brother when you're 10, and they call when you're 14. You don't care about it so much anymore. Big sister, to get a big sister, the wait list is about four months. That means men have to step forward and get involved in kids' lives. And I'm delighted to see men in this audience work in elementary schools. We need them. We need them in elementary schools as well as in middle school through high school. So, as Rodney was moving into adulthood, there were some issues along the way. There was a time he called me and he said, Scott, I'm through with them, never again. What are you talking about, Rodney? No more women, never again. I have to say, Rodney was never too good at picking them, okay? There was a time he was going to kill himself. There was another time when he was living in his car. And one of my friends said, why are you still helping Rodney financially? I'm like, 
because Rodney doesn't have anybody. He doesn't waste his money, but he's always been a cooker and custodian, and it's pretty hard to have a car payment and buy a house when you don't make much money. And I'm helping them because I can. And because I also have received immeasurable benefits from helping Rodney. We haven't talked since last Friday. So, one of the main factors that enables children of misfortune to beat the heavy art against them is the presence of one caring, charismatic adult. And in many cases, that person turns out to be an educator. And I want to make one or two more points, and we're going to be done soon, but when you are with your own children, you have to find the sheer time when they will truly talk to you. Jeremy, by the way, loved basketball. He picked basketball. I mean, I love sports, but I just wanted to make whatever he wanted happen. I can still hear him dribbling like two balls in the kitchen. We put a little goal inside the house, then we put a goal out in the driveway. So, no matter how tired I was, if Jeremy said, Dad, will you rebound? I get up off the couch. I go out there, turn on the lights. By the way, I'm not saying a word. He's relaxed. He's shooting baskets, something he truly enjoys. All of a sudden, he's talking to me, telling me all these things about his life that I want to know about because I'm his dad. I would respond with something really insightful based on my years of graduate study in psychology with my best. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> That's a hard one. I don't know. What are you thinking will make that situation better? I can guarantee you, your students and your own children don't want you to say, do this, do that. You won't have a problem. And a student, a sixth grader the other day says to me, I can always tell when my mom isn't really listening to me because she says something back to me way too quickly. It's truly about listening. And finding that shared time when your kid will talk to you. And I used to always say to Joel, our youngest, I don't care how far away your friend lives. Let's go get her and bring her to our house. So Joel and I have a free and easy conversation, 45 minutes across Houston. And then she and her friend would get in the back. And I was so quiet. And I learned so much by overhearing their conversation. You've got to find that shared time. One more thing about Jill. So Jill has known Rodney her entire life. I'm proud to tell you Jill was a big sister to a 12-year-old girl in Houston. This is what we want to model for our students and our children. When you actually help other people, all of a sudden that little upset that thing you thought was so insurmountable, it doesn't seem so difficult now. We get all these great feelings. One of my fra favorite phrases, it's called the gift of hope. Here's something really great about kids. When something really tragic and sad happens, they want to make the world a better place. And we need to help them. Raise money, raise awareness, do things that are going to help other people. So, very quickly, I had two teachers that were very memorable in Lyons, Kansas. Mrs. A was senior English. By the way, Mrs. A wore dark glasses every day in class. We all theorized she's hung over. <laughs> I don't know if that was really the case. She never took off the sunglasses. But Mrs. A took me aside. She said, Scott, you will be wasting your parents' money if you even attempt to go to college. Well, in a way, she wasn't too wrong. I got kicked out of the University of Kansas for poor scholarship. All I can tell you is that I would have been a really lousy accountant. Sometimes it takes a while for kids to find themselves. But Coach Ed, he was my high school football coach. Then he became the principal, then he became the superintendent. 
So years ago, I sent a letter to Coach Ed asking him to hand it to Mrs. A, telling her, maybe I turned out okay. I mean, I did get three degrees. I wrote a number of books. And I thought I'd actually hear from her, like, you know, so happy to hear that you actually made it through college. Never heard from her. I guess I wasn't one of her favorites, guys. But Coach Ed, on the other hand, he's always been there, always been encouraging. I talk to him every couple of weeks. Coach Ed is 85 years old now. He came to my birthday party last year, and just really nice to have known somebody all the way back to high school, and they're still connected with you. They still care about you. And without a doubt, I know that is the type of teacher you all are. You're in this because you care about kids. You're not in it to make a lot of money. You're in it for the meaning and the satisfaction of truly helping kids. And I know that you do it every way, every single day. And in the last 40 years, what I'm doing today, I've done more than a thousand times. You name it, I've been there. I've been to 18 foreign countries to talk on these topics. Laredo United has brought me here more than any other district ever. And it's because of how much they care about you, your mental health and wellness, and prevention and mental health and wellness for all of your students. Thank you for everything you do, and it was my pleasure to have a chance to talk to you.